Welcome to New Covenant. This is an exciting day, this Confirmation Sunday, and we've got, yeah, clap. We've got a number of students being confirmed. Now, I'm going to invite them to come and stand here in front of the stage right here, all of you students being confirmed. And if you're a family member or a friend or you want to stand with them and support them, you're welcome to stand with them as well. As they come and as they gather, I'll remind you that the questions I ask them are our opportunity to reaffirm our covenants of faith and membership. So I invite you to respond with them as they respond. We, we good? Are we good? That's good. That's better. I tell you, if some of you want to stand down here in the, on the bottom level. I don't know if there's enough room up there. Okay, we'll stand up there. That's okay. That's okay. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to ask you as a group these questions. And congregation, remember, it's our opportunity to respond. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sins? If so, your response is, I do. I do. Second question, do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Again, your response is, I do. And the final question do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Again, if so, your response is, I do. Congregation, again, as I ask these students these questions, it's our opportunity to also respond and reaffirm our membership covenant. <clears throat> as members of New Covenant United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its ministry by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, would you respond by saying, I will? Let's, you guys join hands and let me pray with you. Congregation, reach out and touch someone and let's pray together. We thank you, Lord, for these students that have confirmed their faith publicly before you in this congregation. We thank you for those that have affirmed their baptism, the baptism they received when they were children, and we thank you for these that have been baptized today. We pray, Lord, that you would seal that decision, that yes decision, by your Holy Spirit, and that you'd be as real in their lives as our hands held, and that as our hands are held, that it would symbolize your hands upon their lives. Lord, lead them, guide them in all of their decisions through their life. May they always affirm you. May they always trust in you. and May they always say yes. We commend them into your care. We commend ourselves there too. 
In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. And you guys have had a big day. You've stood in front of the congregation. You've made your, your commitment, your covenant public. You, for the most part, most of you went swimming. It was quite pleasant, actually. I remember one year, <coughs> we had to go back, get bags of ice. The thing had heated up so hot, and uh, you could cook hot dogs and everything. Our daughter and son-in-law um, did an addition onto their house, and um, they were supposed to get final inspection this week, and they needed help, and so we went to Austin to try to help them. They had the inspection on Monday, didn't pass. And so they had to do a bunch of things and did that Tuesday and Wednesday and then had the other inspection on Thursday in the past. And so as a treat to themselves, they asked us to babysit. <laughs> so we did, and we helped them move, you know, get the house arranged on Thursday. And then um, they went out on Friday evening. And so we took the kids, six-month-old Eileen and three-year-old four four-year-old Matic, and we had this exciting time with the grandkids. We went to Central Market in Austin, which is kind of a neat place. I don't know if you've ever been there, but we, you know, had the picnic out on the park, and, and we were leaving and going across the parking lot, and this young lady says, hey, you, who, who are you? And she recognized Matic, and then she says, oh, I bet you're the grandparents, aren't you? Reminded me of a story, uh, an old story back when the days when actors could go around the country without this entourage of bodyguards, you know, you could feel safe. And there was an actor that maybe some of you might remember, maybe some of you won't, Kurt Douglas, who's the father of Michael Douglas. He picked up a guy in Southern California. This guy was dressed in the military uniform and he hitchhiking. And so Kurt Douglas picked the guy up. And when the guy noticed, that it was this, he was probably in his day the most famous movie, st movie star, you know, in Hollywood. And when this young military guy recognized that it was Kirk Douglas, he said, Hey, mister, do you know who you are? <clears throat> the baptism of Jesus is an interesting event. On the one hand, and I'll talk in detail about this, I mean, why did Jesus submit to a baptism of repentance? He had nothing to repent of. He was sinless. I just finished through Lent. I was reading a book by N.T. Wright called The Day the Revolution Began, which is about atonement and the cross and what happened. Uh, N.T. Wright, and, and you ought to read it. It's, uh, it's not a small read, and it's one of those dense books. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? Dance. You know, you read two or three pages and go back and read two or three pages again. And uh, we're going to encourage Dick House to do a class on it. He likes doing that kind of stuff. So it'd be good, too, and I'd come. N.T. Wright says the purpose of the baptism was as Jesus was reaching back into the Old Testament and identifying and tying the Old Covenant to the New Covenant and that it was all about identity. When Jesus came up out of the water, a voice from heaven confirmed his identity. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The first part of that statement is a quote from Psalm 2 about the anointing of the king. Jesus is the new king, the Messiah. The second part of the statement is a quote from Isaiah 42 about the identity of the suffering servant of God with whom God is well pleased. King and servant. That's who Jesus is. And if there's any doubt about his identity, in this story, in this narrative, the Spirit of God also descends as a dove and settles on Jesus. Some scholars think this is a sign and the first clear indication of the work of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together proclaiming the identity of Jesus, of who he is, the Son of God. The Son of God was worshipped by angels and shepherds and wise men, 
and now he's identifying as a human being, as a man on a mission, a mission of his father, God the Father. Now, I don't imagine that when most of us were confirmed and baptized, my guess is the heavens didn't open when you were baptized. And my guess is that no voice, you didn't hear any voice speaking or a dove land on you. But by faith, we know that that's an important event in our lives. And it's an important event in the lives of these young men and women here before us today. In baptism, we claim the words of the Apostle John, see what love the Father has given us? That we should be called children of God, and that, and that is what we are, beloved. We are God's children, it says in 1 John 3, verse 1. When we're baptized, we are initiated into a community of faith. When we're baptized, we're marked as a part of this larger body, this larger community, this community of faith of people who have placed their trust by faith in Jesus Christ. It's not some just simple individual act. We're not isolated children of God. We are baptized into the church. The church responds every time we're baptized, whether we're infant or adult or youth, with its own vow to nurture and protect this child of God in her or his spiritual journey. As baptized Christians, we make sure of some things, but one thing we're sure and certain of is we're not alone, is we're part of a community of faith. The other day, Nathan, I apologize for telling this story twice, you, you'll have heard it twice, but Nathan asked me to speak to the confirmation class about baptism, and I told a story about a, a kid that had grown up with our kids. He was a friend of Scott's. They played sports together. Every time we had evening meal, uh, he was there. Ben was there eating with us. Every time we went on vacation, guess who went with us? Ben went with us. Went to Minnesota and different places, and Ben would go with us. And when the kids graduated from high school, it's like they all scattered, and we lost track. Just out of the blue one day, um, I get this call, and it's from Ben. I haven't, hadn't talked to him in like three years. I'd heard his mother was sick, and, uh, and she'd been diagnosed with cancer, and so... Ben says, hey, let's go to lunch, kind of innocently. And uh, I said, well, sure. It's interesting. Now, this is a kind of a parenthetical story amidst the story. But uh, my understanding, I, I may get these switched, but the day that Joe Broom was born in the Muskogee Hospital, so was Ben born that same day. And Ben's mother had to wait on you to be born, or was it the other way around? Glenda had to wait. Ah, because Ben was being born. So, and interestingly enough, Joe and Ben and Scott's birthday is on the same day. I know that doesn't matter to you, but it was always a fun piece of trivia for me. So I meet Ben for lunch, and I mean, we haven't talked in three years. We're catching up on, you know, where we've been, what we've done, how's school going, what's your major, what are you going to do? And Ben says in this conversation, have you heard about my mother? And I said, yeah, I had. How's she doing? And, and he said, she's not doing very well. <clears throat> and it sort of hit me then about what this lunch was all about. I said, Ben, what happens if she doesn't, if she's not uh, victorious over this cancer? What happen, happens if she doesn't survive? I said, do you have grandparents or aunts and uncles? And he said, I don't have anybody. And then the gravity of this hit me and I looked at this guy that had spent hours at our place and I said this I said Ben look if this doesn't come out like we pray it will you always have a plate at our table there's always a bedroom and a bed for you to sleep in there'll always be a gift under the tree at Christmas you have a home with us don't worry you're welcome here as part of our family. What I told these confirmation students is that baptism is a proclamation. It's screaming that you are welcome. 
And what I want you to know, the first thing, you students, is that this community of faith that screams that you're a part of this home, this family, you've got a place at the table, is a source of support. Now, what happens as we get older, we go to high school, we graduate, we go to college, is sometimes we drift away from this support group, the church. It, you don't have to. We have ministries on college campuses, but the church is here to help us and make us better children of God, make us better followers. And they do that by caring, by sharing, by teaching, by praying, and by forming a wall around us of love, of protection, of guidance. We are baptized, and the one thing that we know for sure is that baptism screams, you belong, you're included. We have family, and you're a part of that family. The second thing it means is the community of faith holds us accountable for our discipleship. Now, that's the way it should work. We have this ongoing conversation around here at New Covenant. I mean, every church that I know of has a worship service, right? You know any church that has church that doesn't have worship? Everybody's got worship services. Everybody's got small groups and Sunday school classes. Um, everybody's got places to serve. I mean, that's our worship plus two, right? So what's the difference? What, I mean, there's all different kinds of churches, and they look different, and they act different. And, and I think part of that is accountability and grace and love, is that we are baptized into a community not only for support but for accountability to hold one another in our walk with Jesus we are claiming some measure of responsibility. When a baby's baptized in here, you may remember that the family stands here in the front, and I invite you to answer the questions with them, and then we take the baby, and we go back here in the center of the worship center, and we all stand up, and we place our hands on the person in front of us till it connects to that family and to that baby and I take that baby and we baptize that baby as a part of this community. And we're saying you belong to us. These are not empty words. We claim responsibility. I even ask you, will you take responsibility for these children, these youth? Sam was telling me right here. He was standing with his friend Lance who was baptized a minute ago. And I said, Sam, when were you baptized? He said, you baptized me, A.C., when we were over in the old church and I was a baby. Sam, good work. <clears throat> we're part of this community together. We take responsibility for one another. When somebody gets off the path, the church is there to call us back in grace and love. When we see a sister or brother struggling with faith issues, with life, hopefully we surround, and I've seen you guys do this. When somebody gets in a difficult place, I've, I've watched you surround that person with love and grace and support. The New Testament gives plenty of, plenty of examples and instruction on how to hold one another accountable. In Galatians, Paul says this in Galatians 6, 1 and 2. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Hold one another accountable in Christian love. Now we know about accountability to some degree, don't we? Well, we just had a day this last week of accountability, right? What's it called? tax day, huh? That's sort of an involuntary, involuntary you know, accountability. Now, when's another one of those moments? I mean, how many of you made a New Year's resolution this year? And do you have any idea how long those usually last? We've got this cousin, and she went to OSU, and then she went on to school to learn how to manipulate and manage and mine, mine data. And she's a data uh, analyst, and she works with internet companies. And there's one online company that has looked at 
New Year's resolutions called Fresh Direct. And they've said that wine and liquor consumption goes up 40% the first two weeks in February. Now, that could be related to Super Bowl, right? Ice cream sales go up 15%. Orders of pizza go up 35% at the same time. And a company that tracks activity by online check-in has pinpointed a day when everybody falls off the wagon for their internet resolution or their New Year's resolutions. You know what day it is? It's February 4th. Most people give up on their resolutions. That's when we see, they see an uptick in visits to fast food joints and a downturn in visits to the gym. So in other words, you're wasting a lot of money because you only go two months, maybe one month out of the year. Church holds you accountable. They support us. And the final thing that the community of faith does, it's here that we receive power to live as disciples. We've been baptized into more than a civic organization. The church, I'm thankful, is not merely a human organization. It's the body of Christ, the family of God. And despite our human failings, we are a community of power. In the beginning, the risen Jesus told his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And 10 days later, when Pentecost happened, after Jesus said that, the Holy Spirit showed up. Boom. They were filled with this power. Jesus promised the power. They got the power. They unlocked the door. They went out and started proclaiming Jesus. Paul says in Corinthians, the kingdom of God depends not on talk, but on power. We receive the Holy Spirit and when we receive the Holy Spirit and we say yes to God like these folks have done, that was a tremendous video at the beginning, I thought. When they articulated, they affirmed that they are saying yes to God, they start together in this journey into the kingdom of God, walking with Jesus, receiving the power from the presence of the Holy Spirit. When the church works together, around Jesus and the power of the Spirit, it's almost unstoppable what the church can accomplish. We've invited you, young women and men, into this community today. Maybe you feel like this has been a major step in your journey of faith. Maybe you feel like maybe you've taken this, the first step and there's some uncertainty, and we want you to know that's okay. Because this church stands here ready to embrace you, to love you, to help you, and to call you on an amazing journey of faith. But along the way, we hope you realize you are never alone. We are here for you. We commend you into Christ's care. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. We're going to invite the band to come. <clears throat> There's communion at each corner. I would encourage you families to have communion together with these uh, family members who have been confirmed today and who have joined the church. And let's continue to celebrate and yield our lives to Jesus. And if you.